Okay, now that we've set up our terminology and understand how to use it for things like boundedness, we can return to our um, axiom of completeness and see what it actually means. So here it is. Uh, the axiom of completeness is every non-empty set of real numbers that is bounded above has a least upper bound. It means that this is the one thing that we're going to add to our system that defines for us the real numbers. And it just tells us that things that are bounded above have at least upper bounds. So supremums always exist for sets that are bounded above. It may seem kind of trivial at first, but for example, we've previously shown that the square root of 2 doesn't exist in the rational numbers. But we could come up with a sequence of real numbers, or sorry, of rational numbers that approximate the square root of 2 to as accurate as we like. Um, so that set of numbers is in fact bounded above. And the axiom of completeness says there is a least upper bound, and that will be the square root of 2 that's what we needed. So our axiom of completeness actually implies a couple of quite interesting theorems that we'll be making use of every now and then throughout this course. And the first one is known as the nested interval property. So we've got essentially the way this theorem is set up is we've got our number line and we have a whole sequence of closed intervals. So here might be a1, b1. And then inside that, we've got another one, a2, b2, a3, b3. And the defining feature is that each one is enclosed within another one. Okay, uh, within the following one. So we've got these nest, these intervals which are nested inside each other. Um, so we can write them down as a sequence like this. That This symbol here just means i1 contains i2. The bar on the bottom means that it could potentially be equal to i2. And the theorem is that this set of intervals taken all together mean that there is a number inside all of them. Um, so it says the theorem says that this um, set of intervals has a non-empty intersection. That means if you take all of the sets and look at the overlap of all of them all at the same time, there is something in it. It's not empty. Okay, so we're going to show that we can prove this using our axiom of completeness. So I'm going to, the way we're going to do, go about this is show that if we take the left-hand endpoints, a1, a2, a3, etc., they form a set of numbers. And that set is going to be bounded above because the b's are all upper bounds for this set of numbers a. There's no way any of the b's can be on the other side of any of the a's. So we're going to show that the greatest, sorry, the least upper bound for the set of A's is actually the thing that's in all of these sets. Okay, so let's just set this up. So proof. We'll consider the set A to be the set of ANs where N is in the natural numbers. Okay, so it's our set of left endpoints of the intervals. Note, each bn is an upper bound on a. Okay, so a is bounded above. And hence, sets that are bounded above have supremums. That's our axiom of completeness. And hence... by the axiom of completeness, which I'll just abbreviate as AOC, um, A has a supremum. Try that again. Axiom of completeness, A has a supremum. Now I'll just call it X. So we'll argue that X is in all of the intervals. Okay, so we're just going to take the nth interval and then we'll show that x must be inside it. So consider in to be the interval a n b. And notice these are always closed intervals. Um, <clears throat> so clearly x is greater than or equal to a n, because remember, x is the supremum of the set of all the a n's put together. So x is greater than or equal to all of the a n's, so that's given. And also, 
x is less than or equal to bn as bn is an upper bound for a. Okay, and x is by definition the least of these, so x is less than or equal to bn. Okay, and so we've actually, we're actually done. We've shown that x is greater than or equal to an and is less than or equal to bn, and so it's inside the interval. And that's all we need, because our interval has been chosen arbitrarily. It doesn't matter if n is 10 or 1,000. Uh, the argument works exactly the same way, and so x is actually in all of the intervals. And hence, um, our theorem is proven. Second useful theorem, which again, perhaps at first sight, seems a little bit uh, strange, is the Archimedean property of the real numbers. Essentially, this uh, links together the natural numbers and the real numbers. And the theorem says, given any real number x, there is a natural number larger than it. Okay, so we can always find a natural number beyond any real number we come up with. This one almost seems too self-evident to prove, but we actually need to do this, and it, sh and it comes out fairly quickly from our axiom of completeness that we can do this. Okay, so let's have a go at proving this. Uh, part two of it, by the way, is pretty much the same thing, but we are looking at taking any positive real number and we can always make a rational number 1 over n to be smaller than it by choosing n large enough. Turns out part 2 is really easy to prove once we've got part 1, so we'll just focus on part, part 1 for now. So proof part 1, suppose there was an x and r such that x was greater than or equal to n for all n and the natural numbers. Okay, so we're going to attack this by contradiction. We're going to assume that there in fact is an x such that x is bigger than or equal to all of our natural numbers. So this is just a way of saying the natural numbers are bounded above by x. So then n is bounded above by x and by the axiom of completeness has at least upper bound alpha equals soup of the natural numbers. Okay, so remember we're attacking this by contradiction, so hopefully we're going to find something absurd by just taking this reasoning and following our nose. Okay, so this means now I'm going to take this upper bounds and I'm going to subtract one from it. So this means alpha minus one is not an upper bound for n. So there exists n in the natural numbers such that n is greater than alpha minus 1. But if we rearrange this, this implies alpha is less than n plus 1. And n plus 1 is a natural number, and so alpha is not an upper bound for n. Okay, so it's kind of a convoluted and slightly circular feeling argument here, um, but essentially we've just designed this alpha minus 1 so that it will turn into an n plus 1 because we know that if we have a natural number n the next one along is also a natural number and so this maybe slightly artificial seeming setup with alpha minus 1 here was just so that we could get n plus 1 and n plus 1 was going to be guaranteed to be bigger than our least upper bound alpha contradicting alpha being an upper bound which means that our theorem is true 
So part two. Here we can actually just make use of part one by just changing it around. So this says given any real number, any positive real number y, there exists a natural number with one over n is less than y. So we're just going to let x equal one over y. Then by part one, there exists n in the naturals such that n is greater than x follows that's exactly what uh, part one of the theorem said it follows that 1 over n is less than 1 over x they're both positive things we've got inequality theorems that guarantee this will work uh, which equals y okay so part two essentially is just a different it's just piggybacking on the work we did in part one okay so this this theorem basically gives us arbitrarily small uh, natural uh, rational numbers if you like or alternatively we can always find a natural number beyond any x this can be quite useful when we're constructing proofs if we want to switch between using real numbers and natural numbers for some reason um, this one lets us justify the types of steps we often want to take so we'll imme immediately make use of this to show the density of the rational numbers inside the real numbers so we're going to state this in the following way it says that for every two real numbers a less than b uh, just a shorthand way of uh, defining two arbitrary real numbers and telling us what order they come in there is a rational number in between them so a and b are not equal they are just two real numbers so let's just put them here's our number line let's just for the sake of argument assume they're positive and here's zero we want we're asserting that there is a rational number uh, somewhere in between these two so the idea is if we take a small enough denominator then we can make a sequence of what am i doing that's not right a uh, sequence of rational numbers one over n two over n three over n and if they're finely spaced enough then by the time we get to our interval then there will be an m over n between a and b so what we want to do is we want to make sure that we choose this denominator n large enough uh, so that the spacing is sufficiently fine that we find ourselves in between a and b okay so how do we choose 1 over n to be small enough well essentially so long as 1 over n is less than that size there then we're going to be guaranteed to cut to pass through this interval that we're after so here's how this works so we can kind of see intuitively this is going to work and once we've figured this out the rest of it is just a matter of translating this into um, what we're actually after so we want to choose n such that 1 over n is less than b minus a and just so happens that we just proved a theorem that says we can do this Okay, so this is going to be by Archimedean theorem or Archimedean principle. Okay, that's that sets the fineness of our little mesh here, and now we just need to find out what m must be, um, and then we'll be done. So notice our inequality is a is less than m over n which is going to be our rational number we haven't figured out what m is yet we've fixed n already m is still to be determined this is equivalent to a n is less than m is less than b n okay so that's quite nice um, that's our inequality um, it looks a bit tidier this way and this gives us a clue as to what m should be so we're going to choose m to be smallest integer greater than a n so now all we need to do is show that m is less than b n need to show That m is less than bn 
perhaps the easiest way to see this is to go to our statement where we defined what n was. Notice this one here is equivalent to, again, I'm just going to multiply out by n. 1 is less than bn minus an, or alternatively, an plus 1 is less than bn. Okay, so just make note of that because we're going to use it again in a second. That's b times n, sorry, not b sub n. <clears throat> okay, so our choice of n means, remember we chose m so that m to be the smallest integer greater than a n. So this means that m minus 1 is less than or equal to a n. Okay, because m is by definition the smallest integer greater than a n, so if I subtract 1, I have the next integer down, and that has got to be less than or equal to a n, otherwise our choice doesn't make sense. Now this implies, if I bring the 1 across, that m is less than or equal to a n plus 1. But, as we see from up here, a n plus 1 is less than b n. Okay, and that's all we needed to show because we needed to, nope, we just wrote that down. We need to show that m is less than b n. Uh, we just did here, and so we are done. So the way we express this is we say that the rational numbers are dense in the real numbers. That means no matter what two real numbers I choose, I can always find a rational number in between them. Now, if we think about it for a little bit, that does seem kind of weird because um, we've kind of said by construction that our real numbers are the rationals with extra pieces added in. But we've got this weird relationship where despite that, despite the real numbers being in some sense a bigger set than the rationals, there are still rational numbers in between every pair of real numbers. So this leads us down a bit of a rabbit hole that we're not going to go down in this course, but it is sufficient to say that it maybe doesn't, there's a little bit more going on here than immediately meets the eye, but the rational numbers are dense within the real numbers. And as it turns out, so too are the irrational numbers. Given any two real numbers a less than b, there is also an irrational number between the two. Now I'm not going to prove this one in great detail, but we can use the previous proof to do this. If I look at a plus root 2, b plus root 2, then let m over n be so I'll satisfy a plus root 2 is less than m over n is less than b plus root 2 by our previous theorem. Uh, so I've just taken my interval a and b, I've added root 2 to both sides, I've just shifted across by root 2, and then I've found a rational number that fits in between the two. If I now go and shift back again, I see a is less than m minus n minus root 2 is less than b, and lo and behold, this number here is irrational. So not only are the rational numbers dense in the real numbers, so too are the irrational numbers. And that will be enough for this video.